Uh, so welcome to our third salon in our series on the self in the age of simulation. Today, we're going to be discussing faith in an increasing, increasingly globalized world. I'd like to welcome Shadi Hamid, who's a columnist and member of the editorial board at the Washington Post and the author of The Problem of Democracy. Bill Cavanaugh, who is a professor of Catholic studies at DePaul and recently published the book, The Uses of Idolatry, and John Milbank, who is the emeritus professor in the, de in the Department of Philosophy at Nottingham. Um, so I've had all of you on my own podcast in the past, and I've tweeted several times about the idea of trying to get you guys together because I've seen so much overlap in your work. So finally, this is a kind of a, a dream come true. So thank you guys for, for being willing to come on to the discussion. Thanks for having us. Okay. So, all right. So just to start things off, let's, uh, I want to talk about what are some of the most immediate benefits, but also the immediate drawbacks that you see of globalization and mass media for people who are religious people, uh, religious believers, people of faith. Whoever wants to start us off can jump in. Yeah, sure, I, I can get the ball rolling. Um, I mean, in some ways, of course, uh, globalization is the realization of the ideal of um, a Catholic world, right? Catholic meaning universal global uh, and um, the idea that we we can all become one is uh, part of the promise, uh, I think, of this. Um, part of the difficulty, of course, is that it tends to um, subsume the local under the universal, and, um, and that's had uh, definite uh, drawback effects. Um, it's largely being driven by corporate power in, in a lot of ways, corporate and state power. And so that, that kind of um, unity uh, is in fact just kind of reproducing other uh, kinds of division. And so um, uh, divisions between the rich and the poor, uh, especially, you know, the part of what makes globalization possible is just moving manufacturing to places where you can trash the environment and pay people poorly. Um, in in the religious world, I think um, in some ways there's a uh, it, it's had a uh, both a positive and a, a negative effect. I'm thinking in the Catholic world, you have a much more direct access to um, the Pope. The Pope has much more direct access to the faithful, and I happen to like the current Pope, and so I think that's a good thing in many ways. Um, in other ways, it's kind of distorting of a more traditional model where a local community is more important and the Pope is there as court of last resort rather than CEO of Church Incorporated. Uh, and you also at the same time get the rise of parallel magisteriums such as um, the kind of uh, right wing Catholic world that's very well funded and very well disseminated through a whole series of media that make their case directly to the faithful in the pews without having to kind of be mediated through, um, you know, bishops and, uh, and other kinds of uh, tempering sort of uh, authorities. So um, positives and, and negatives. So maybe I'll take it from, you know, a slightly different angle. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, going through some of my own religious struggles currently. Um, I'm making a more conscious effort to be and become more religious in my own faith tradition. Obviously, as many of us know, that can be challenging and there are sort of ups and downs and ebbs and flows. I do think that the universalist aspects of mass, ma universalizing aspects of mass media and globalization sort of cut against what I associate with the religious impulse, which is partly a desire to be like left alone and do your own thing and focus on your relationship with God. When there's so much noise around you and so much pressure to be the way other people want you to be, I think it's much more difficult to focus on that individual vertical relationship with God, which is obviously a very personal one. So that's maybe, you know, one one thing I would just note. Um, 
but I'm also generally just to state my priors. I'm also a believer that, and it's somewhat odd to say this as someone who works for, <laughs> uh, you know, a major newspaper. Um, but you know, there is something to be said for the idea that ignorance is bliss. That for most people, it's sometimes better not to know, or it's better to know less. And I laid out the case for that actually last year in an essay for the Atlantic before I started at the post and the title was you're better off not knowing. So I was very straight up about it and unapologetic about making that case. Um, most of the things that we interact with and perceive in a kind of globalized mass media landscape are not particularly helpful for us. And they're not particularly helpful, obviously for a more contemplative philosophically oriented life. And um, I think all of this has, you know, um, not very positive effects on religion and maintaining a kind of religious sensibility or a religious uh, impulse. Yes, I, uh, um, if if I could just come in there, um, uh, I I agree with all that's been said so far, but I also think there's possibly a more basic point and and that is that uh, absolutely globalization is primarily um a secular phenomenon it's it's a phenomenon overwhelmingly of the global market which as bill says is often exploitative but one could also suggest that as an accidental effect of that secular globalization um it can be that religion becomes more important. Um, why? Because religions, uh, you know, the world religions, the post-axial religions are inherently global phenomena. And uh, Bill's, you know, already mentioned, I think, one example of that, that um, because we live in a more globalised world, um, the papacy becomes more important, you know, and Ultramontanism is, is a very specifically kind of modern Catholic um, phenomenon. And, and that, I think, has been more and more the case ever since John Paul II had enabled. But, you know, a much more obvious and startling example is the question of the power of global Islam. You know, the, the ever since 9-11, um, uh, you know, the, the, the fact that Islam is a global religion and it can operate beyond borders and that uh, at least large sections of Islam are uneasy. And, you know, I can partly understand this about, about modernity, you know, has become uh, a considerable factor um, in, 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 you know, in, in what is going on. But I, I think the other thing that I, I would also want to say is that, um, you know, and this relates to what Bill is saying quite rightly, you know, that Christianity, the Catholic faith is part of it, is driving towards the universal, you know, to that point where where God will be all in all and so on. But But we have an issue, I think, about the contrast between what people of faith of all different kinds of faith will probably see as a kind of fake universalism and a true universalism. And so I think, you know, the true universalism is about a transcendent reality, you know, a transcendent standard of the good and the true and the beautiful in which we participate. And just because, you know, it's beyond our grasp because we can't fully get hold of it or control it, it can be mediated locally in different ways, you know, so that all the big religious traditions, I think, have example of that. They're, they're incarnated differently in different local ways. So that, you know, one question you could really seriously raise here is whether, you know, the positive power of religion nowadays might be that it can mediate between um, the one and the many. And, and a lot of our problems at the moment are, are struggles between a very abstract notion of the universal globalization, liberals, you know, Bill Gates, whatever, and people insisting on their local particularity, but sometimes in quite unpleasant 
and sometimes quite atavistic ways. And I think that, you know, the real problem is that too many religious people are tempted to jump one side or the other. You know, they're in American terms, they're going to go for Kamala Harris or or or, or for Trump, you know, and that maybe neither option is is quite the right one um, for Christians or even um, you know, people people of other faith, because the danger is that religion is just recruited to a very secular notion of the universal, you know, something very utilitarian or universal rights, you know, which is after all only about the assertion of individual freedom. Or on the other hand, that religion gets instrumentalized behind nationalism, you know, and people, uh, some people that I know, and I think should be ashamed of themselves, have become kind of national conservatives in the name of Christianity. And, uh, you know, we know what's going on in Hungary, which at first looked quite good. But as time has gone on, it doesn't look so good. It looks like a using of the Catholic faith, because it's simply part of Hungarian tradition, you know, and, um, and it, it seems to me those are real dangers. And instead, the religions should be perhaps suggesting that they have special ways to mediate the universal and the particular. Yeah, and I, I, I mean, I think we already see how there's a lot of overlap between your your approaches to these questions, but also the the unique new uh, nuances that you bring into it. I think, especially what John is saying about how difficult it is to maintain this tension now that. The global has so much power. We're more inclined to to swing the pendulum to one extreme or the other. Um, but also with what Bill was saying about the influence that corporate power, state power, power now has, that's much more difficult to manage, considering how large the proportions are. Yeah. But also what, what you're saying, Shadi, about the personal dimension. I mean, all this political turmoil and the ways that religion gets implicated in it. Uh, what is the individual person to do as they're trying to sort out what do they believe? How is God present in their life? Um, how do they how do they discern, uh, you know, what what if God is real in the first place? Um, so, yeah, these these questions are kind of intensified, magnified because of, you know, the geopolitical circumstances. Um, but that being said, I did want to ask Shadi if um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the things you said in your latest book. Um, the problem of democracy, because, you know, you bring up how a lot of these major Western powers have attempted to import liberal democracy around the globe um, and how much we struggle to embrace the fact that democracy can of often yield, as you say, illiberal results, especially talking in the context of the Middle East. So maybe could you could you explain a little bit what you're trying to get out in your book and and uh, yeah, what were you trying to convey with this thesis? Uh, you're muted, Shadi. So this is, you know, long been a pet peeve of mine, this Western tendency to conflate two related but distinct concepts, democracy and liberal democracy. And it's done without any kind of self-awareness or even so often in our kind of public discourse that we just forget that this is even an issue. But I mean, historically... Um, liberalism, small L liberalism and small D democracy have been in tension. And increasingly over the past uh, 20 years or so, we've seen how they come into tension in a number of different geographical contexts where you have free and fair elections. And I think there's this expectation that if you just give people the freedom to vote, they'll choose rightly. There's this kind of unfounded faith in the wisdom of crowds, that we give people the tools and then the right education, the right information, and then they will ultimately choose well. And then this raises the question of what it means to choose well. Who decides what are right choices versus wrong choices? And you know what we found, whether it's in the Middle East during the Arab Spring or India with the rise of far-right Hindu nationalists or with the rise of the far-right across Europe, even Western Europe, in ways that are obviously quite striking, we have to kind of pose this question of, well, when people are given the choice, they don't necessarily choose um, 
the classical liberal tradition or even um or even the kind of progressive liberal tradition and i think this really forces westerners to ask themselves some difficult questions what is the point of democracy is democracy a means to other things that we hold dear or is it an end to itself is democracy good irrespective of the outcomes it produces and you know these are very challenging questions for americans and i think donald trump you know brings this you know brings this to the fore in a in a pretty profound intense way because if god forbid in my view americans choose donald trump for a second time in november i think you're going to have a lot of you're going to have tens of millions of members of the democratic party and liberals asking themselves if this is what democracy produces not once but twice then is democracy a good thing um so this is that's the kind of tension and the set of dilemmas that i tried to explore in my book using cases in muslim majority countries because in some ways um muslim majority societies have been ahead of their time or another way of putting it they previewed what would become more prominent in the west before we were talking about it in america or in Europe, this tension between democracy and liberalism, that was the prevalent conversation whenever you had an election in an Arab country, because who would win in free elections? Islamist parties, in other words, parties that wanted to prioritize the role of Islam or Islamic law and Islamized society to one degree or another. And we as Westerners, we looked at that and we said, how are these how are these Arabs and Muslims using their right to vote in such a in such an unsavory manner? And then we realize that this is what voters across the globe have been doing in their various contexts. And um, there are legitimate reasons for people to choose illiberal parties. We don't have to like it or agree with it, but I think we have to understand the impulse that leads a growing number of voters to choose non-liberal or anti-liberal options. Yeah, and I'm just continuing on this topic of the role of religion in, in the context of a liberal democracy. I mean, both you, Bill and John, have talked about the way that in general, in at least in secularized democracies, there's this, this narrative that the state is neutral, that while there is freedom of religion, the state doesn't claim to have any it doesn't, doesn't take on any metaphysical or, or moral um, positions. Um, and John, I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about why why you find this claim to be suspect. What are what are some of your suspicions when we hear? Oh, uh, well, uh, well, I think Shad has raised absolutely brilliant points. You know that we 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 pay lip service to democracy all the time, and yet. Again and again, democracy has proved dangerous. It produced Adolf Hitler. It, it, it's, uh, it, it has elected Trump. It could elect Trump again, you know. Um, and, and yet, having said that, I think that it's only in theory that we believe in democracy because um, the entire, on the right, you know, the entire Hayekian project was about minimalizing democracy in favor of the rule of the market. So the market was going to do the job and that Hayek deeply distrusted democracy and the continuities between that and the far right to be more and more advertised. But then when we look at the liberal left, which tends to focus more on culture, it's, it's really no better, you know, that increasingly the liberal left thinks everything should be done by the courts, whether in in Britain or America, you know, that things that most, you know, continental Europeans think are matters of continuing debate, like reproductive, uh, you know, uh, the laws around reproduction uh, are in frame. You know, look at the recent Democratic Convention, a framed in terms simply of, of rights. So they're, they're in that sense removed from democratic debate. So, uh, you know, just to complicate things, I would say that I distrust both democracy and liberalism in a way, because, I mean, I think this kind of liberalism, whether it's economic or cultural, um, is, is trying to say, 
we know eternally what the right thing is, you know, and this is surely going to be a lie, you know, that we're, humans are not going to change their mind or arrive at deeper discernment. So this kind of overextension of human rights, you know, uh, and and the whole idea of a human right, I think, is debatable. But certainly the, the overextension of the idea of human rights is very bad. And, you know, I'm not an anti-democrat in the sense that I think we do need popular assent. And to some extent, you know, Vox Populi, Vox Dei is, is, is a position sort of rising within Christianity, uh, you know, out, out of the idea of the sort of general discernment of the human mind. But, but that can go, you know, um, terribly wrong. So, so, so we, we seem to land up, you know, we, we, we need popular assent, but there are also some things like protecting the dignity of the individual that, that should be protected from, you know, the mass of the population deciding Jews are bad people or Muslims are bad people. You know, I mean, we know that these are real dangers. And, and it's for that reason, that I think myself and Adrian Paps and others have been slowly, slightly unusual in, in, in seriously questioning, you know, the ultimacy of liberal democracy and suggesting that we need to return more to notions of mixed constitution. And, and this isn't totally eccentric because after all, you know, once upon a time, people thought that Democrats were only kind of Jacobin radicals, you know. no, Even in America, nobody thought they were really doing pure democracy. The whole idea of representational democracy suggests that you have not simply mandated people, um, but figures that should be, uh, in some sense, aristocrats, in some, like, you know, senators in America, um, engaged in trying to discern the, the, right, the right course, and then sort of putting that um, to 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 the people, if you like, and th and then we have a kind of monarchic, or in the U.S. case, a, a kind of presidential role of of uh, uh, of an important level of kind of sort of integration, maybe between you know the rights of the individual and what what the mass of the people want. But I think my idea of a kind of politics of the good life or a politics of virtue or something like that would be suggesting that we need much more idea that the politics is guided by trying to search for good human fulfillment. In other words, not just what people want, you know, not just choice and not just kind of material happiness, but sort of flourishing in in the sense that Plato and Aristotle and people like this understood. And something that's, you know, just as powerful within the Islamic tradition as with it, the Jewish or the Christian tradition and probably has sort of equivalence with, with somebody like, like Confucius. And it's not that we know once and for all what the good life is, but there should be, there's a kind of continuous attempt to discern that, you know. So it, in a way, it's that joint discernment that helps to mediate um, between sort of respecting the individual, respecting the greater wisdom of some people compared to others, and yet at the same time, acknowledging the fact that we do need consent, you know, because we're, we're not trying to rule by force or or or. or or violence, you know, and and I think finally that it, it's it's because religions do have some sense that the good is not just something we've made up, you know. It's 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 it it's really there, you know, in some sense. Um, that that I think that they are favourable to understanding that that kind of situation, and I think what we've got at the moment is increasingly just a massive crisis it's it's a crisis of trying to relate um the one to the many it's a crisis of trying to hold liberalism and democracy 
together. And I, and I do think that, you know, unless we move to this kind of metaphysical level that, you know, people like Alistair McIntyre and Charles Taylor were probably the first people to open up, but, but, but in some ways we need to take that further. You know, unless we look at that level, we're not going to be able to resolve our, our current global crises. Yeah, and I I, I want to ask Bill to comment on I mean something that you were saying earlier, John, about the role of the market, uh, because and Bill, you've written a whole book about how this kind of myth of neutrality mm-hmm. is used as a mask to uh, to cover the way that the market is kind of a pseudo religion, um, claims to be free when in reality takes a, assumes a kind of deific role in in public life. So, Bill, can you can you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, in some ways, the the problem is the same uh, as the the kind of philosophical problem of liberalism, right? If you define liberalism as the priority of freedom over the good, um, that's kind of what's going on in the market as well, that you claim to be neutral, Mm -hmm. that you can't decide what people should want. Um, All you can do is let them choose. And, uh, and then by some uh, act of providence, the invisible hand of the market, it will all work out uh, to everybody's benefit. And it's just false. It just doesn't work that way. Um, the market obviously doesn't. Uh, basically, what you've got then is a situation in which um, there's nothing but power. You've, you've taken away um, deliberation about what's really good um, in some objective sense and you've replaced it with nothing but power. And so neoliberalism, I think the best definition of neoliberalism is uh, the attempt to use the state to defend corporations from democracy. And that's yeah. that's basically almost inevitably what you're going to end up with. Um, as Shadi was talking, I was thinking about the work of uh, Saba Mahmoud, who talks about um, uh, secularism in the Middle East and the attempt to kind of find this neutral mechanism, uh, which is going to um, uh, ensure the rights of everybody. And so you have the, you know, the Ottomans are pressured to adopt uh, Western notions of religious liberty. And that means respecting the liberty of individuals and it destroys the the kind of uh, autonomy of, uh, of, small uh, communal groups, especially Christians in the uh, in the Middle East and so on. And so um, uh, minorities then are seen as a threat to national cohesion after you get the rise of the nation state and so on. And so the, the idea that this is all going to work out um, uh, in, in that there's this kind of neutral mechanism where we don't have to talk about the good uh, we can just talk about freedom. It's just not working and it's just not going to work um, for what seemed to me to be pretty obvious uh, philosophical reasons. I think where I would disagree with John, I, th- I think I agree mostly with what John has to say. I'm just not sure. I think John is probably more sanguine than I am about the possibility of using the state to, um, to educate for the good. And I tend to be more of a kind of bottom bottom up, take a sort of bottom up view uh, on this. And so that means that uh, more than just criticizing the the market or the corporation or using trying to use the state to tame the tame the market and tame the corporation, um, we need to um, uh, be trying to create other kinds of economy uh, that are non uh, exploitative and non uh, idolatrous, and that is something. I don't. I don't, I'm, I don't think John would dis- disagree on that. But I. Well, no, I wouldn't I'm disagree. Sure. Sure. No. Yeah, no. yeah. But so, so my, yeah, I, I think kind of um, uh, doing that at the grassroots level is probably the best uh, that we can do. I mean, part of what what I think gets us into Christian Christian nationalists today are. I have a sense of what's wrong. But I think the um, the attempt to use the state to correct it is kind of compounding the, the problem. Yeah, can, can I comment yeah. quickly on that? Um, yes, I mean I, I mean I think I'm quite a lot more suspicious of the state than you say, and I I certainly think that sort of the attempt to impose our ideas 
of the nation state on the Near East has been a you know complete disaster, as people like Eli Kedjeri argued, kind of against the 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 British typical approach, and then the American. You know that's it, it's 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 not really kind of natural um, to to Islam to to think in that way. Um, and 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 I I definitely do think that uh, I mean if one thinks of um, if one thinks of you know capitalism and the free market as sort of disembedding the economy from other social relations in the way that Karl Polanyi said, then the trouble is that you sort of destroyed a natural society, a society of many different localities and corporations and complex overlaps and so on. And then the question is, well, how do you try to put some of that back? I mean, not as it was, but in a more egalitarian, how do you put it back again? And to some extent, yes, I agree with you. It's got to be bottom up. It's got to be a cultural effort and so on. But given that most people are being it exploited. I think yeah. you are up against the kind of paradox that you sort of need the state to put back artificially what was once there naturally, if you, I could put it that way. But so that I think there's a middle way between the idea of, of total state bureaucratic control. And I agree with you that that can be just as bad, just as, you know, people not being properly paid fall into total state dependency. And, and by the way, that's probably exactly what's going to happen. People, most people in the world nowadays, young people, they're not married, they're on their own, they're not even having sex, they're just increasingly dependent on state benefits. There's a brilliant article today in Unheard by Joel Cockett. Um, about this, you know, and 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 that's not a good situation either. But I do think, you know, somebody um, like Will Hutton in Britain has argued this. There are kind of more strategic uses of the state, you know, that the the state can sort of act in partnership with business and unions and civil society bodies and churches to you can it can try and lay a framework for better practice, you know. So as if Bill is totally rightly saying the free market is actually engineered by the state and by by yeah. legal he's right. That the, the state can try try to sort of shape something right. more like a social market, you know. So I I I'm not a statist, but 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 I do think the state has, you know, probably um, some role to play. And, and by the way, this looks incredibly different. If you're in a huge country, you know, the, yeah. the, you know um, it, it looks rather different when you're in sort of smaller European states, I think. Yeah. And I think what John just said starts to answer Ben's question that he put in the chat. Um, we're going to have time for Q&A. So Ben, if you want to dig a little bit more into that, we can uh, later on. But Shadi, I do want to ask you to jump in here and to talk about, uh, in the context of the Middle East, especially in, in Muslim countries, uh, how does this, this conversation about, you know, ultimate good, this kind of deliberation that we're saying, how do you see that panning out? Well, I get nervous whenever I hear people talking about the good, not because I don't believe in the idea of a kind of ultimate or religiously inspired sense of the good, capital G. It's just that in in modern pluralistic societies where we have this kind of messy, unwieldy diversity on any number of of levels, it's very hard to know what who decides, like who decides what the common good is. And I think you see this in in pretty stark fashion throughout the Middle East during the Arab Spring where even in relatively homogenous countries like Egypt, and here I mean relatively 90% Muslim, 5 to 10% uh, Christian, depending on different measures, but still the 90, the 90 or so percent is ethnically and religiously homogenous to a large extent, unlike say Iraq or Lebanon, but even in a country like Egypt, um, Sunni Muslims among themselves don't agree on the appropriate role for Islam in public life. They don't agree on the appropriate relationship between Islam and the state. And that's why you have, to oversimplify, 
Islamists on one hand and so-called secularists on the other, and then you have any number of shades in between. So even when you're sort of telling Muslims in a particular in a particular national context, like choose, vote, and try to express your values in in public, they have very, very intense disagreements about what that means. And that ultimately led to a military coup in 2013, where you had a secular elite that said, again, to oversimplify, we don't like it when the masses vote, because when the masses vote, they vote for this party that we don't like called the Muslim Brotherhood. So let's just undo the entire democratic experiment, because we have a different conception of what Islam should be, different than theirs. And then you have a massacre subsequently that the, the worst mass killing in modern Egyptian history, which happened in August 2013. And then we see different versions of this across the Arab world. And so so that that I think, you know, it, it shows us what that can look like. This question of who decides what is and the only way, to, in my view, to really decide these things is to give it up to the people and say, look, we live in diverse societies where people can't agree on the common good. And because of that, we have to adjudicate those questions through the ballot box. And then for certain periods of four or five or six years or whatever it might be, then the elected government has sort of is in this role to kind of promote their own conception of the good. And then if voters don't like that, the next time around, they can say, well, actually, we change our mind. We don't love that conception of the good that the government is promoting. Let's try a different party and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. And that's why I think ultimately democracy is the only really kind of intellectually consistent way to address this problem of diversity. Otherwise, you just have um, a reversion to force where you say, look, all bets are off. Whoever has power then imposes their conception of good on the rest of society. And then it becomes this kind of existential battle. Um, and I'll just end with this point that this is where I think the question of the state becomes very important, because if you start sort of seeing the state the central state, the centralized state that is entrusted with promoting the good, then that raises the stakes of elections, where then you're going to say, well, whoever wins the election then captures the state. And so there's a kind of tension there that you want, you want democracy to adjudicate these questions, but you don't want the state to be so empowered that democratic elections feel so existential that either side or any number of sides isn't willing to accept losing. And that's become, there isn't actually a great answer to this. I mean, um, there's always always going to be a tension there, but I think at, you know, in the end, you have to find ways to limit the power of the central state. So that way people don't feel like elections are a kind of holy war. So, you know, if to, to use that, to use that phrase. Yeah, and I just want to bring up the essay that you wrote for First Things a few years ago. I've been kind of contextualizing violence within, you know, modern Islamic societies. And I think this also kind of hits on something John was saying before about whether it's in the name of, you know, uh, like an ardent secularism or Christian nationalism, the way that this kind of anti-Islamic sentiment is, is propagated simplifying the very phenomena that you're just talking about now, like how there's this intense emotion behind these these conflicts, these elections. Um, and again, it, it's easy when you're outside of these countries to simplify it and just say, oh, well, Islam is violent and we have to just, you know, lock it out as much as possible. Um, and this, I, I, I want to ask Bill if you can comment a little bit on this, because you also, one of your earlier books is about the myth of religious violence. How do these kinds of narratives um, shape the way that secular or mainly Western societies conceive of the relationship between religion and violence? Sure. I mean, we tend to think that there is this thing called religion out there and which has a, a fundamentally greater tendency to promote, promote violence than whatever is not religion, so secular. Um, and therefore, we need to marginalize religion, um, and that is a way towards 
peaceableness uh, in our societies. And so the way that tends to work uh, then is, you know, we we know nothing of is of Iran pre nineteen seventy nine, um, you know the the coup in nineteen fifty three and the you know twenty six years of the Shah's rule and so on, a secularist regime. Um, we suddenly wake up in nineteen seventy nine and there's all these crazy people chanting death to America and we say oh well, they've had some kind of weird religious uh, revival. And, um, you know, what, what else can you do except bomb them into democracy? Um, because, uh, you know, religion has this, has this tendency um, and it's age old, you know, it's ancient and there's not much that you can do to, to root it out except to try to marginalize it. Um, and, and in that way, then the myth of religious violence becomes uh, um, uh, a justification for secular violence. You know, we're going to make the remake the Middle East, Middle East in our own image, uh, and then you get the Iraq War uh, and so on. And you can see this dynamic very clearly in Sam Harris and um, uh, the, who's the guy Bernard Lewis uh, from Princeton and so on. Um, and so what I've tried to do in this book is um, is make the case for first of all problematizing. This idea of religion. Um, what are what are we talking about um, it, when we talk about religion? Uh, and then um, try to uh, uh, undo this this narrative that this is this peculiarly dangerous thing because people kill for all sorts of things, um, and you can just as easily kill because you don't think there's a god watching over you as you can kill because you, you think there's one that's inciting you uh, towards violence. So trying to level the playing field, not at all denying that people do and have and continue and will kill for Islam and Christianity and other things that are commonly labeled, labeled religion, but they can all just as easily kill for democracy and liberalism and uh, the free market and and the workers revolution and nation and flags and oil and so on. Um, so trying to uh, to kind of bring some balance back into the conversation uh, that the problem is violence and not uh, so-called religious violence. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I do want to open the floor to questions. I have a few more, but I, I just uh, for the sake of time. If any of our guests want to jump in, either if you want to type in the chat, if you want to unmute yourself, we can go ahead and open the floor. Yeah, I have some thoughts. Oh, so um, my background is in um, the political philosophy of Robert Nozick and his uh, aspirations towards meta-utopianism. And I see that as the answer to this problem of subjective values and subjective appreciation. Um, obviously, you know, the, the Muslims will say Islam is correct and the Christians will say Christianity is correct and the atheists will say atheism is correct and go to war and whatnot, and that's all self-destructive. Whereas if they all, you know, create their own societies and then practice together and develop and choose among one another and, and proselytize and whatnot, then uh, we can have a, uh, over a long period of time, uh, deliver a process which occurs on the individual level, on the family level, and so on. This is how Christianity grew from being, a, you know, a thousand people in early uh, Roman Empire to being a large percentage, a majority percentage of the population in the Roman Empire. And that continues today, this this deliberate process. So, for example, um, you know, we have some people who are um, who are expressing their fertility and will participate in the next generation and other people who are not, who are voluntarily absenting themselves from the gene pool. And the cultures associated with that second practice will shrink in relative uh, proportion just as they did in the, the early roman empire and uh so it seems as though like we're on a path towards the uh the amish inheriting in the united states and i don't think that's necessarily a bad thing that's a an expression of our culture an expression of the choices that each individual is making in the context of the belief systems that they participate in and uh i think if we want to have a good outcome, or if we if we see that as not the ideal outcome, then what we should do is lean more towards um, supporting uh, cultural bubbles in which different cultures can be expressed, 
and that different practices can be developed so that rather than have like a Western uniculture, we have a diversity of approaches, which, you know, uh, work on the same process of proselytization uh, and persuasion. And, uh, you know, that's the kind of path that that I'm trying to follow. That's the kind of path I think that that is giving energy to the ideas of the network state and and uh, new city development, which, which there's quite a lot of uh, interest in that in the Austin area. And so I, uh, I, I have hope that we can, uh, that this is a path forward. Um, how do you all reflect on that? Can you yeah, say I, more I, about what's the new city um, movement? What is, what is that about? There are a number of efforts to create um, new towns or cities in the, in different contexts. So one example is Esmeralda. It's a project of Devin Zugel or Zugel. I'm not sure about how to pronounce your last name uh, in Northern California. Another one is uh, the Earthship Project, which is they're trying to build a city um, over by San Marcos um, that kind of bridges Austin and, and San Antonio, um, et cetera. Yeah. I've got my own project in that sphere. Well, well, yeah, my, my immediate comment on that is that the United States is an incredibly peculiar place. And the danger of Americans is always generalizing from the United States. For one thing, it's incredibly underpopulated. It's an absolutely vast area in which it's possible for, you know, people to have bubbles and do their own thing. Despite that, it's incredibly violent. So actually, pluralism doesn't work in the United States either. And it's not absolutely not the way forward. The way forward is to try to find um, the common good. And what I'm noticing here, and also in Shadi's comments, is a, a not totally coherent oscillation between liberalism and democracy. It seems like basically you're both saying sort of liberalism and pluralism is the answer. But, you know, there are some areas we all have to collectively decide on. We can't really agree about that. So we let one bunch of people ha have a go one time and then we throw them out at the next election. Um, what I think is wrong about this is that I do think we need metaphysical debates and metaphysical elections because the result of the not being any real debates about what the good human life is, what human flourishing is, is not that we have mild elections. Look at what's going on in America at the moment. But neither the Republicans nor the Democrats have any serious political agenda to speak of, but they are outing at each other because there's precisely because it's not a rational debate about the good they're stuck in these very fixed sort of ideological identities you know a sort of liberal absolutisms about you know reproductive rights on, on, on the one hand and then on the on, on the other hand um you know, in intransigence in about supposed American greatness and an incoherent mix of protectionism, um, you know, with free market anti-statism. I mean, there is no rational discussion going on there at all. So I think my idea that we need a more serious debate about sort of thick human values um, wouldn't create conflict. It would mediate things because then the second point I would make is actually this idea that we all radically disagree is massively exaggerated. You know, if if we think of the great world religions and of a lot of sensitive people, if I said to them, look, the point of human life is something like achieving contemplation, being creative, participating in politics and educating the next generation and being given the economic wherewithal to do that, we would probably start agreeing. And, and, and we could then sort of relate some of these more controverted issues to those sort of metaphysical questions about what the, the good flourishing human life um, actually is. So I don't think that my recipe is a recipe for more conflict, but actually the opposite. So and maybe, it, uh, sort of, yeah. Yeah, so John, I would just maybe clarify one thing. I'm not saying that people shouldn't debate the kind of thick metaphysical questions and bring forth their comprehensive doctrines into politics. I'm very much in favor of that. I'm just very skeptical 
that that kind of process of of debate around foundational questions will lead to a shared set of premises. So I think it's I, I think it's fine to have a kind of cacophonous political scene, more more along the lines of the kind of what the agonists would say, or you know, what you know Chantal Mouffe and and other agonist theory theorists have yeah, put really forward disagree. is that you know it's messy, it's yeah. conflictual, and that no. con. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I no are you carry on. It's fine. <laughs> no, I just don't like that line, but carry on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean again, I, I would just I would just maybe pose the question to you. I mean, where does this confidence that we're gonna be able to come to some kind of common conception of the good? I mean, if you if you talk to folks who don't believe in God, who are sort of staunchly secular. I mean, their starting premises are entirely different than someone, you know, some, you know, questions around God, which are no longer shared and which are, which lead people to come to very different conclusions about what to prioritize. There just isn't really an obvious way to paper over that or transcend that. And, but I would also just maybe add one more thing uh, and then, you know, feel free to push back is the U.S. model has worked actually pretty great. I, what you said sort of awakened my patriotism where I just feel I have to kind of defend America's honor. I mean, for all of the problems yeah. that we seemingly have, uh, this is pluralism in action. We have very conflictual sets of beliefs and values and commitments as Americans. We have profound disagreements. We don't always express them in the right way, but we know that they're there. But yet we haven't descended into any kind of mass violence. American democracy has proven to be resilient. Um, we still do have the strongest, most vibrant, innovative economy in the world. Obviously, I, and maybe Bill might take issue with the kind of the emphasis on annual GDP growth as being the best metric of economic success. But if we use a lot of the traditional metrics, America is doing better than its competitors. Um, and when it comes to pluralism, I think when we look at the UK riots or the French inability to integrate Muslims or to even want to integrate them, now the Swedish government is talking about financial incentives to actually encourage Swedish citizens who are Muslims and other unassimilated recent migrants to actually leave the country when you look at these other examples, you have to come back to the U.S. model and say, wow, we really have something great going going here. And, and I, su I suppose it depends how you look at it. But I would just make I, I, and I, of course, I'd be curious, like, um, you know, how you would respond to my kind of pro-American sentiments there well, I, 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 you know I, there, are, there are loads of good things about america i mean you don't actually have um the kind of huge muslim populations that france has or even even britain has so i'm not sure that's a very fair comparison and, and i also wouldn't want to over contrast europe and america i think america has held together you know largely because it has inherited sort of traditions of the common law and uh you know constitutional um principles which it's you know adapted uh and so on you know whether it can hold together in the future i i'm not so sure but i'd rather address kind of the bigger question uh about about whether we're bound to disagree i mean part of my point is that we we do need um this sort of religious sense of an ability to mediate between um you know, the particular and the universal. So I suppose I'm nakedly in favour in that sense of more religious influence. But what I mean by that is that I want secular people to ask themselves seriously, serious metaphysical questions, you know, in relation to, say, the, uh, the position on abortion or attitudes towards crime, sort of these questions are never really seriously uh, asked, you know, what, what is human life, you know, what, it, what is punishment for? And inversely, the problem with religion today is that a lot of it is modern and decadent. 
You know, the Muslim Brotherhood is modern and decadent. Mo a lot of Sunni Islam, I'm sorry to say, you know, since it's thrown out its mystical traditions and so on, has become very modern and decadent. You know, and, and it sounds more and more simply kind of voluntaristic and authoritarian, whereas there are other traditions within Islam. The same thing can be said about most of American evangelicalism or about, you know, American Catholic conservatism, which is increasingly extrinsicist and just about arbitrary authority. In other words, if religions were true to their tradition, they would be much more rational. They would be talking um, much more in terms of a discerning reason, but kind of mystically um, understood, you know. So we're in, a, we're in a total mess, but we very much do need to have a new version of more authentic traditions because ultimately our problems are problems of secular modernity that but, but, can't but, be solved within the terms. Of very, quick very quick follow-up, but yeah. isn't part of the issue here that you know, secularists and liberals, or at least many of them, they don't act, there isn't actually a developed metaphysics there. I mean, liberal, no, liber right. and I, I think that if you, oftentimes when you push liberals on their first principles and you ask them like, where do these ideas come from? You say that you believe in human rights, but what is the source of human rights? liberals will often really struggle to answer those deeper first principle yeah. questions and i think that's part, i think that's by design i mean by definition and not to say that all progressives are liberals but if you're a, if you're somehow a kind of progressive you believe that we have reached kind of conclusive answers about what is right and that there's not a lot of reason to relitigate those yeah. deeper questions because it's like we've gotten there. This is progress. And anyone who right. disagrees with so yeah. I I don't see how you can push people well, because, with that kind of premise to engage I, in the I, metaphysical I the, way, the, way, the way you push them is to say that there's a contradiction between what you say and what how how you actually live. So for example, you know, even if we look at the realm of law, in in fact. It, it much more has a sense of inherent equity than it, than it would claim in theory. It's not really just positivist and utilitarian and only about rights, although it's becoming more like that. And even if you look at the way people um, live their lives, you know, they're trying to pursue something like the objectively good life or when people come to have children and, and educate children, they don't just treat them um, the only values of, of uh, you know, what you want to do or being materially happy. They try to encourage them towards some sort of excellence. And to the degree that we've stopped doing that, we're in a mess and everybody's in mental breakdown. And, and, and so on, you know. So I, I I, I'm not saying that my solution is easy, but I'm saying it's the only solution. So I, I do want to hear Bill's thoughts on all this, but Anna, I mean, you, you've, I think you have a couple of things you want to say. Do you want to jump in? Hi, uh, yeah, as a Hungarian immigrant in the US, I uh, I also applaud Shadi's point about the, there's something special about America and how you guys deal with immigrants is bureaucratically a nightmare, but in other ways, um, it's there's a reason why people want to come here and they want to become American citizens. Um, I mean, one thing I'm kind of missing here uh, in this discussion, or maybe two things that I think are very important. Um, one is, I do believe that humanists or humanism has a metaphysics. As a humanist atheist um, who used to be religious, I definitely do have the metaphysical direction in my life. Um, I think most humanists are aware that humanism arose uh, on the ruins of something. Um, it's just that humanists think that there's a reason why we pass by earlier stages of development. You don't have to necessarily um, reject them. Um, I do think that most liberals are aware that they are claiming values in a most irrational way. Values are irrational things. You can't really have rational debates about them, right? Um, they know that the earlier foundations used to be religious. We are completely aware that when we want human rights, um, this used to be a religious ideal. And we understand that it's a constant struggle, both an intellectual and an emotional one, both a collective and an individual one, to try to redefine the foundations on which we can 
not just espouse these values, but maybe explain to other people to whom it's not obvious. You know, humanism might lead to liberalism. It might mean lead to a belief in markets that people can revert to the mean eventually through cycles and figure out what is good for them, right? Um, I don't, I mean, you know, you can define neoliberalism in 10,000 different ways. Um, I'm pretty sure that very few neoliberal lists, I don't even know what the, the demonym of that country of thought is, uh, would place freedom above everything, right? I mean, that would be a complete contradiction of the term. And in some cases, I mean, in deep disagreement with my values, humanism can also lead to various soft versions of socialism or social democracy. I mean, be my guest, you know, whatever works for you. Um, and I think there is there is something there that is deeply human and it's deeply diverse. Um, I, I mean, if you guys, guys read some newer pieces on this, the dawn of everything that argues that European liberalism is uh, an heir to um, Native American uh, uh, um, uh, town hall discussions. Uh, I think that's that's a beautiful idea. So I do think that there is something there that is not tragic and it's not ignorant. Um, and there are people who believe in this and we are not you know, full of shit here. This is like an actual deep belief that we would be willing to die for. And it's very important. Wait, who's we? Sorry, who's we here? I, let me represent liberals or liberal Democrats. Um, and I think there is it's not just lip service. Um, it's something that people went to the Second World War for and packed their kids into li into lifeboats, you know, so I, I would just like give some respect to that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Other, can, let me just uh, make my other yeah. point. I don't want to take up the floor um, twice. Um, I think it's really, really important. I mean, I, I read your book, Shari, and, and you know that I have a lot of thoughts on Hungarian illiberalism. I'm a political immigrant. Like I literally packed up my entire life when I was 30 because I really, really deeply believe in this and left everything behind and started from zero money. Again, I, 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 I'm, st I'm sitting here in Boston right now as the embodiment of these values and build this company on, on these values. Um, it's one thing to think that people will choose through democratic means an undemocratic outcome. And then it's, a, to me, a naivete to think that they will get a second chance. And I think what you all three guests here beautifully seem to align on is to feel a little bit tender for democracy and feel that there has to be something that I do believe in the wisdom of crowds, not just the platform that Shadi is building, but also the idea. But sometimes there is lack thereof and the system has to be robust enough so that, I mean, there's a reason why we don't give children matches and leave them alone in the house, right? It's not that we don't respect them or we don't respect their will. It's because there might be processes there that they don't yet understand. Um, no individual is able to understand the entire process. Um, maybe Elon Musk, we know he, he gets all of it. Um, and so I think there is a value to thinking, did people really want to elect Orban? They had a chance in 1998 and they did not. Right. And then there was a completely different crisis in the country that made sense years late. No, sorry, 1998, they did. 2002, they didn't. Right. And then the other things happened that made that seem like a good idea. But in every subsequent election that I'm voting in as a Hungarian national, is that really an election? There's no free press. There's no... I mean, Egypt knows a lot about what it means to have a completely fragmented opposition and the tradition to keep them fragmented, a textbook, a 100, 120 year old textbook perfected through multiple different dictatorships to make sure that there's no other choice. Is that a democracy when, when the populace has no other choice, no other source of information? I do believe that more information is better. So I think we should really differentiate between like, on the one hand, liberalism and how, what come, what traditions in liberalism come from humanism and what don't? When does it tip over? Because trust me, illiberalism is not humanism. And on the second, what does it mean to have one choice? And how can we ensure that society actually gets the choice? Like Shari, you said every three, four, seven years, whatever the, the terms are. So these would be my two very long, short points. Yeah, so Bill, I'm gonna ask you to jump in in just a second. I just wanted to, 
pull out two things from Anna's comments. I mean, first, and I appreciate you kind of making this case for liberal humanism as a tradition itself, because I think, yeah, today, especially in a globalized world, it's much harder to articulate what exactly liberalism means because there are so many iterations of it, but there is a tradition. And yes, I think the others are right to draw out, to pull out the fact that yeah, it's building on something that came from the past and largely is building from the Christian tradition, which doesn't delegitimize humanism per se, but like there is this tension and it's, it's worth, it's worth taking it seriously, even if you don't buy into it fully. Um, and then the other thing you're saying about, you know, the Orban situation It, it's interesting to me because I realize midway that I'm being uh, recorded, so now I worry about my family. You know, because illiberalism is great. Well, but to, I mean, to your point, it's um, when you're when you're saying how like okay, the country is going back and forth on its position with Orban. Like, it it makes me call into question the legitimacy of a democracy in the first place. Not to be a, a total uh, pessimist, but like. there are so many factors in play that influence the opinions of the people that influence, um, especially when we talk about the role of mass media, like you see how, you know, the people can be swayed to believe a lot of things. So like one minute they may believe a certain political figure is, you know, a detriment to their, to their future. And then maybe the mass media starts signaling certain other uh, things that, I don't know, like there's a change of opinion. So like, In a democracy, like I, this goes back to John's point about the role of local communities, deliberation within the more immediate context. Like if that's totally eroded, then yeah, like can there be a democracy? Um, but but Bill, if if you can jump in, I yeah, I, I'd like to hear some of your thoughts on all the different stuff that's just come out. Sure. I mean, to pick up on that point, um, uh, Stephen, that you were just making, I mean, in a lot of ways, it seems like Um, what we have today is much less pluralism than we used to have uh, in the U.S., where you've, you know, um, before the rise of mass culture and mass media, you had actual differences between people who live in Alabama and who lived in Oklahoma and who lived in Washington. Uh, just to take a fairly trivial example, regional accents have faded into a, a kind of mass monocultural American accent. Um, and that I think is representative of, uh, of this process of globalization, which has happened in, at the level of the nation which is just the way that, um, that mass culture, a kind of monoculture has overtaken uh, genuine sort of local cultures. And that I think is important to the way that we talk about pluralism because we've always, we, in this conversation, we've been talking about we, you know, what are we gonna do and how are we gonna agree Uh, and so on. And part of the question is, who is this we that we're talking about? And I think we reflexively talk about the we as bordered by the nation state. And I think that in a lot of ways is part of what our difficulty is, is that we can't get ourselves out of thinking about any other way than getting 330 million people in the United States to get on the same page. We think as if there is one table around which we gather or there's one public square. And I think um, one of the interesting, and that's not pluralism at all, that's a kind of monoculture in which we get these conflicts over who's going to guide the monoculture. And so something like what the English pluralists like John Figgis were trying to articulate, I think is something like what we need to get back to now, that the pluralism is not just within the one space that we've been given, um, but the pluralism is a pluralism of spaces. And so um, we're thinking both in terms smaller than the nation state and cultivating local forms of community and other kinds of association lower than the nation state, like trade unions and other, you know, churches and, and mosques and other kinds of, of ways of organizing. And also thinking in larger terms than the nation state and thinking more uh, globally 
and these kind of trans, uh, not a kind of global monoculture, but kind of um, uh, transnational networks um, that, uh, that can be cultivated. And I think in a lot of ways, that's sort of what Pope Francis is about, is kind of going both above and, and below uh, the yeah. nation state in trying to kind of um, uh, uh, um, revi revitalize culture. Uh, in this way. And so I really think, and, and John, you've written about this in terms of- I'm in massive agreement with you here. Yeah. Yes. Agreement. Finally, simple agreement. space versus complex space, right? Um, yeah. What we really need to be looking at is, is trying to complexify space um, because that's in large part, that's what's mm. uh, been lost. Yeah, and it's just to, to wrap things up, I wanna kind of pull a couple of uh, lines of thought together. So I think, for, Bill, what you just said, I think this is kind of um, a crucial starting point to facing a lot of these very complex questions about uh, not just religion, but like democracy, freedom in a globalized world. Um, yeah, I, I think you're right on. I think that we could say that this is a Pope Francis fan club. Francis, if you're watching, we love you. Well, we I love the guy since I saw his it. tiny apartment in the Vatican, like he could yes. live in the and he lives in this tiny apartment. I'm like, he's a New Yorker. He gets it, you know? No way. Yeah, yeah. No, but at th this point about um, the agency of, of these local uh, local institutions, if that's, yeah, if that doesn't exist, then like these conversations aren't really happening. Like if we're just having it virtually, if we're having it just uh, on the level of national politics, like is it, I mean, to kind of take a Baudrillardian line here, is it even happening at all? Um, so I don't know, I think this might be a call for getting involved in civic organizations and churches and mosques and local politics, um, because even if, no, I mean, if, we may not have the power to like change what's happening on a global scale, but like, yes, we can, uh, we can do something in the most immediate circumstances. And I think one of the other things that, that John is saying is within these contexts, Part of the conversation does need to revolve around metaphysical questions. It can't just be purely material, purely pragmatic. Um, and I think when we pay attention to our lived experience, these metaphysical questions naturally arise, um, particularly when we're talking about, you know, the prospect of having a family. Why is it worth procreating, starting a new life? Um, but also in the face of suffering. I mean, people get sick and die all the time. What does this mean? That question naturally arises. It doesn't have to be artificially imposed from on top, you know. Um, but also I appreciate with Shadi, I mean, your defense of, you know, in light of America's numerous problems, uh, the issues we have, like there are plenty of things that do work out well here. I mean, I think we need to be cautious not to be too pessimistic because I know the fact that we can have these conversations, the fact that Anna's saying she came here so that there can be this freedom to discuss these ideas, like something, some things are working here, you know, and we can't discount that. We need to to look at that and kind of, I don't know, create spaces to cultivate what are already, what the good things that are already are happening. Um, so, and I'm, I'm happy that disagreements did come out. I mean, I think this is a good thing because it gives us more food for thought. It uh, forces us to kind of refine our ideas. Um, so before we go, Ben, did you, did you want to, if you quickly wanted to just jump in? Yeah, I just want to say um, there were a couple statements that led me to believe that I think some of you or maybe all of you should uh, seek to acquire a friend who is someone who's a uh, on the right that you respect, that's an intellectual so that you can understand the perspective of, of that world, because there is a logic to it. There are legitimate con concerns. If you don't understand them, then how can you, uh, you know, refine your own perspective and, and address it meaningfully? So I, I, you know, I think that's essential. The Braver Angels is an organization that facilitates communication between people on the left and the right. Uh, but there are, you know, public intellectuals and whatnot that you could uh, reach out to. Maybe yeah, I think uh, that's, coordinate yeah. something. Yeah, no, I think that's something we should all aspire to do, to be in dialogue with people across ideological spectrums. But but I also think it's interesting how a lot of what all of you guys were saying today don't really fit very neatly into any kind of 
ideological box like that for me is very refreshing i was gonna say i mean ben, ben's comment is interesting because i don't think this is necessarily true but my sense is that all three of us at least according to some people are right coded i mean i certainly can speak yeah. for myself like there's often the assumption an incorrect one that i'm on the right just because I take religion seriously and am a believer myself and I want religion to play some kind of public role or have public expression in our society. So it's, it's interesting, Ben, that you you sort of read us more as being left-coded, despite the three of us all having an emphasis on a public role for religion. Mm -hmm. And we just note that. I, I don't know what to make of it, but... Yeah, I mean, especially if we look on Twitter the way that you guys are all construed. I mean, Bill, I know you're not, but maybe it's it's better that way. But, Wait, how are we construed on Twitter? I mean, Shadi, I mean, you're right. I think people about yourself, yes. Like I, think, <laughs> I think yeah, with the religion thing, it throws some people off. But then I know some right leaning people who are not necessarily crazy about all your ideas. But I mean, John, you you, I mean, obviously you throw people because I know. I know people who, uh, yeah, no, I, I think because your ideas really, really are very hard to to pin down. It's uh, yeah. yeah, I'm a kind of le I'm kind of left conservative, uh, it probably, <laughs> you know, or or a kind of Tory socialist in British terms, but it's a long tradition, you know. And I mean, somebody I, I don't agree with her about foreign policy, but Sarah Wagenknecht's ideas, I think. Mm. She's a kind of left conservative mm. in in Germany. And uh, I, it, she's a very intelligent woman, and I find a lot, quite a lot of resonance with her. Mm. Yeah. So, but just Bill, I, I, you shouldn't uh, feel bad missing out on Twitter. There's, there's not much <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I don't at all. No, I'm much better off that way. But... Yeah. Anyway, all right. So thank you everyone for for joining. Um, this it really was a it was a fun discussion. I I was looking forward to it and it was uh, well worth it. So um, yeah, tomorrow we have our last virtual salon in the series um, featuring Catherine D and Esme Partridge about New Age spirituality and social media. Um, but yeah, thanks everyone again for being part of the discussion. You're keeping with my family. She's my future daughter-in-law. So no, she so is. Yes, yes, I didn't know that. Stay, stay with us. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much, All right. Stephen. Thanks, Stephen. Yeah. Thanks, All right. Guys. Take care, everyone. Great Thanks. to meet you both, John yeah. and Bill. Yeah. Good to Thanks meet you. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks, Thank you. Good to see you. Thanks John. for the Take care, Thanks for the bye -bye. comments as well. Thank you, everyone. Thank bye. You. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.